Thanks so much for having me here. I'm here to talk a little bit about um, some experiments that you can do at this game jam that uh, you're about to participate in with procedural generation and artificial intelligence, um, since that's what the jam is about. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I, uh, who, who I am first and uh, how I got to this place. And first, I just want to say I'm so amazed at the work that Solop is doing. Uh, I well, only sad thing about doing the talk here is that I can't watch what you're drawing <laughs> because I was really enjoying the last part. So yeah, okay. So yeah, who am I? Uh, so I used to work a long, long time ago, back in the mists of time. I was a product and project manager at Google uh, in 2004, like really a long time ago. Um, and then I went and I worked at Facebook as well in internationalization and product management. And I found myself in 2013, at the start of 2013, really, really sad and really uh, uncreative. I had somehow lost the creative spark in my life and I had spent a decade in spreadsheets um, and working on things for big business. And so I left and I wanted to make video games. Well, actually I wanted to write fantasy novels and then I realized that in order to actually make some money in life to pay the rent, fantasy novels are not an easy way to do that but fantasy games, on the other hand, are. <laughs> so after working on a few small titles, I ended up uh, at Larian Studios, um, where I wrote uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, and also the um, story for the upcoming Baldur's Gate 3. And then I went to uh, Nordic Game Jam, uh, and I met this guy, Martin Pichelmeyer. He was the head of the games program at ITU University. He's now part of the creative AI group there. And uh, we started to make little experimental things together, things that Thorsten would, would like. <laughs> little, little games, little art house things, little indie things. We made a small uh, iPhone uh, word puzzle game called Vitriol, which, is, uh, which bleeds you through the seven stages of alchemy in a Kafkaesque bureau bureaucratic nightmare. Um, so we started making a lot of experiments together on the weekends. Um, and then as we started to get close to the pandemic, uh, we started to work a lot with, um, our, with procedural generation. So we made a ton of Twitter bots. We basically made a Twitter bot every weekend for a while uh, and really enjoyed those. So Five Sparrows on a Vampire, which named itself, that's why it has such a weird name, um, tells us what to eat for dinner every day. So that was made, <laughs> that's like made of a whole load of ingredients and techniques and things like that. And we have actually made recipes from this, and they have been pretty good. We actually cooked one live on a, for a proc jam, the procedural generation jam, a few years ago. And we have one called uh, High Cookies, um, which is uh, haiku fortune cookies. Um, so if you send it a tweet, it will give you a personal haiku, haiku for just for you, for this moment. And then, as we started to get into the pandemic, we got a real taste for AI because we sat then at the same table, me, a video game writer, Martin, a computer scientist who worked in the creative AI group. Okay, yeah, we started by using a bunch of free tools out there that are hooked into OpenAI's large language models. So back then, in 20, late night 2019, early 2020, that was things like the InfraKit demo. Of course, today, everyone's using ChatGPT, which is like the hot new thing, um, working with GPT-3. I'm sure you've all tried it out, or at least seen it at work. Um, so yeah, I, I gave it a little thing there. I was like, hi, hi there, games now. She said, hoping they would feel the power of artificial intelligence nourishing their creativity. But little did she know that this moment with her fellow futurists and gamers would 1K cost her her job. So thanks a lot, guys. Um, <laughs> excited to see what happens there. And what, I, what really excites me about this kind of working with AI and, and doing experiments with writing with AI is this space of weirdness and strangeness that there is to explore and exploit and pull things out of. So like, here's an example. Uh, at a time, <laughs> you might remember there was a time last year where there was a cube on the moon. Every time I talk about this, people look at me like I'm crazy, but there definitely was a news story about a cube on the moon. A few days later, it was revealed not to be a cube, but for a few days, it was very exciting to think about this cube on the moon. And at the same time, there was a huge storm in my hometown back in, in Dublin, and uh, there was a jeweler shop. And the jeweler shop had a huge silver orb sitting outside and it fell off the front of the shop in the storm and rolled down the middle of the street in the waves of rain. It was extremely dramatic. So in this, I was feeling very excited that week. <laughs> so I was writing some poems, orbs on the earth, cubes on the moon. 
and I asked Infraket what would come next. And it's like tentacles in a bottomless swamp, flowers upon the human breast, flesh upon the face of God, teeth upon the face of the deep. It just keeps getting better and better. Like each one of these lines you could take and make an entire story out of or use as the entire basis of a game, right? For, for a game jam, like it just keeps getting better. So this is the space that's exciting for me. And that kind of taste, just made me and, and Mar crave more of this stuff. So what we started doing was experimenting even more hands-on with the, with the language models that are available. So back in 20, 2019, uh, OpenAI made their GPT-2 model available and open source. And Max Wolf made a notebook in Collaboratory that um, allowed us to train the model using any file we wanted. So it would allow us like fine tune uh, the GPT-2 so that it would speak more in the voice of what we wanted it to look like. And this started our real excitement because we spent a weekend for Proc Jam 2019 uh, making, feeding the model with Alistair Crowley's Book of Thoth Tarot, which is a book which is about the meanings of different tarot cards. And we then remixed the meanings of those tarot cards by using numbers specific to Alistair Crowley's magical system to pull out new meanings for each tarot card and also illustrate them using procedural generation. And we got some really, really interesting stuff. And like you can imagine the two of us, like we were just sitting at our little kitchen table, which is about the size of this table, with our fingers covered in like nacho cheese <laughs> dust, like just going absolutely wild at 2 a.m. because we couldn't believe how exciting this stuff we were making was. So you can see here a few of our examples. Like, look at this first one. I make a living disguised as a god, wearing a helmet of somber serpent's wing, a phenomenon rarer than death. I am chaos in the form of a wolf. And my favorite line of any of them is down at the bottom there. I am the only character in the book that appears in the final chapter. So just, I feel like whenever we made any of these things, we just got so excited about the possibilities because it sticks so close to the voice. So we started running these workshops for writers, uh, for regular writers, because we wanted to teach normal writers how to do this so that they could understand and enjoy and have the same exciting experience as us where we'd painstakingly train the models together. <laughs> they were like three hours long. We would train the models together using collaboratory. Mar would troubleshoot for everyone who had problems with using the code and everything like that. And everyone's eyes would light up so strong with what, when they would see the possibilities and the potential and what we could actually do here. But it was really difficult and really slow. <laughs> so we decided at that point that we were gonna make our own tool um, to make it easy for writers. So we got some research funding from the Danish government um, and working as a research project out of the IT University in Copenhagen, we built our first prototype, which you can find at writewithlika.com. Um, and we recently, we finished that research funding at the end of last year. And the Danish government, in their amazing generosity, uh, gave us more funding to turn it into a commercial enterprise. So over the next few months, we're going to try and make it into something that works as a commercial thing. But right now, it's still free, and you can get in, and you can use it for free. So this is a good time to get in. Um, and I'm going to show you. So if you just click on Apply for the Beta, um, at, at like maybe 3 o'clock today, I'll go to the wait list and just add in everybody. So if you just write Alto in your reason for wanting to join the beta, I will just add you in and skip the wait list. Okay, so that's how we got to where we were and how we got to where we are. And that's not very interesting to most people, right? Because we want to actually use these things. You want to do something with it right now, today. Let's make something. And so I have made a small website <laughs> that you can look at. So if you want to take down this link, tunguska.ai forward slash games dash now, all of the resources that I'm going to talk to you about for the next while, for the next five experiments, are gathered here on this website. So you can easily uh, look at it, click into the links and have it ready. If you forget or if you want to know it later on or anything, just send me a message and I'm happy to send you the link as well. Okay, so now let's get into some experiments. So the first one, uh, we're going to do five in total, um, and we're not going to do them all live because, as you can imagine, it's a nightmare going back and forth in and out of live things. We're just going to do the last one live so that it's not too stressful. So the first experiment is making procedural poetry with Ephemeral Rider. 
So you might remember when I was talking about procedural things earlier, I talked about these little Twitter bots that Mar and I made. And Mar himself made ephemeral writer. So basically he uses ephemeral writer is a way, was a way of making tracery, uh, the, the tracery language accessible to non-programmers. And when you say non-programmers, it's really me. It's to make tracery accessible to me. But now everybody else as well. <laughs> so everyone else gets to benefit from me not being able to do things, which is great. So what it does is it just makes variations of text that you provide, any kind of variations of text that you like. So if you can tell it that there's five kinds of birds, and then it will use those five kinds randomly instead of always mentioning the same bird in each sentence. So it's very safe, it's very simple, it's very predictable, and you have total control, unlike AI, which can always throw you a curveball. Procedural generation is something that you <laughs> completely own and, and control every piece of. So if you need to know what's going to happen, then it's a very safe way of, of working. So you can get it here, you can get it for free uh, on itch, you can download it or you can use the, the web version here. This is the link, the link is also in the website that I sent you so you don't have to write down this giant link here. But there's also like full like help text and you can also load um, our haiku bot and you can load our recipe bot so you can see the exact code that we used to make the haiku fortune cookies and you can see the exact code we used to make um, the, the recipes and then you can copy that or, or mix and match and change it around to make something else that's the same kind of format but using the stuff that you want to use instead. And as an example, on the resource page, there's also a really easy template you can copy and mess with to make a, sh a really short four-line poem and <laughs> that you can mess around with as much as you like just to learn the system and understand how to work with it. So you can see here, like, you've got line one, I always knew the nouns one, and then nouns one further down the page, it will give you either crow, cathedral, diamond, or vice. So there's many, many ways that you can mix and match all of the text together to make things. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, why would this be interesting for making a game other than just making weird Twitter bots or experiments? It's actually super good for making lots and lots of inventory items or barks using your own lore or the stuff that you have for your game. So I've been working for a while on, an, on, a, on a massive and ridiculous uh, role-playing game inventory item generator. Um, which basically pulls in different names for weapons, descriptions for weapons, for armor, for potions, for all these different kinds of things, and just pulls it all together. Um, and so you can just make like a hundred at once. And there's just so many variations that never looks uh, boring or, or anything like that. So Kate Compton, who's going to be doing a talk this afternoon, has a fantastic uh, article, which is also linked <laughs> on the resource page, called uh, 10,000 Bowls of Oatmeal, which is like, her way of describing the problem with procedural generation is when you can make so many things that they can actually start to just be a little samey or not interesting or not exciting. So it's really, really part of the part of the challenge and part of the excitement of working with procedural generation in an artistic way to make it always feel fresh and exciting and unique by putting in so much content and authenticity and honesty and soul from your own work to make it happen. Okay, experiment two. Training in artificial intelligence on your own writing. So you can use collaboratory notebooks for this if you want. Um, you, we, I also have a link to that <laughs> in, our, in our resource page um, in case you, for some reason, do not want to use Leica and want to train collaboratory notebooks by yourself. Um, but the way that it basically works um, is that like using your writing and a prompt will give you more of your writing. So here's an example. Here, this is um, Edgar Allan Poe. If you start off a sentence like, one night Thomas returned home to find five teeth in a small pile on his doorstep, he picked up one of the teeth and examined it. It was not human. So the black text was me writing, and the pink text is Leica finishing it in the, in the style of Edgar Allan Poe. So we've basically tried to streamline the process of what we were doing in our experimental writing workshops. Um, because you just come in, you, you upload your own writing, you train a brain with your voice, your characters, your concepts, um, or you can train on anything that's in the public domain. So, interesting thing there, public domain. We do not let people come in and train brains on uh, living authors, because we are firmly in the camp of the writer at writewithlika.com, and we are interested in the future that writers can have with artificial intelligence, not in the future that we see so often talked about on Twitter, where the great thing about AI is that it's going to be so productive that you can just uh, fire all your writers. 
I mean, I'm a writer. That's not what I want. <laughs> I want to be able to work more, more, uh, more effectively, more interestingly, more fun, and more intelligently with the new technology and bring it out. So, part of what we're trying to do is make a platform where writers can come and maybe like share their brains, maybe even monetize their brains in the future, if we're able to work with the publishing industry, but to really work with writers and not be a replacement. But yes, just as a note, you cannot come in and upload all of Tarantino's screenplays or upload uh, the Disco Elysium corpus and make uh, a game, make, make, make stuff out of that yourself. Okay, but yeah, it's basically, you, it's a mimic. Um, yeah, it's a mimic. It does not understand um, the material that it's receiving or producing. It's just using language models, and that's like determining word probability by analyzing the text, interpreting the data, feeding it through an algorithm, and then establishing rules for using uh, for natural language. So the model is basically just applying rules to, un to think about what is most likely to happen next in a sentence. What is, what is an accurate way that this sentence could go using this particular writing uh, text here as a, as a template or as a format? So it's just imitating what might happen next in a sentence. So if your writing uses lots of descriptive language and ellipses, then that's what you're going to get. It's a very you-are-what-you-eat kind of a vibe. <laughs> what you put in is what's going to come out, and that's how it goes. Um, so if, what it's useful for is m many things. So firstly, you can work with... Uh, you, you can see here the different ways that it works. So if I use the same prompt, deep down I always knew, the top one is using the Dracula brain. The middle one is using a brain that's made on a bunch of Dostoevsky's books, and the bottom one is used made using a brain made by um, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. That's my favorite brain, and it's the best brain. And you can use this brain as a therapist. You can go to the Marcus Aurelius brain and say, what should I think about such and such problem I have? Marcus has got your back. He's going to tell you exactly what to do, and he's just wonderful. So you can see even here, he's like, deep down, I always knew that this was the path I had to take to face my fears, to love what I do, and to work with what I have here at my side. Very different from the Dostoevsky depression fest and the Dracula <laughs> weird, creepy fest. So this is an example you can see how, it, how it's different depending on how you've trained the brain. So why would this be interesting for games? Well, you can create lots and lots of in-world content that you can edit to magnificence. So as a writer, I can tell you the, the, like, the job of the writing is really like a small part. The first part of the writing is the small part. It's the editing to make stuff good. That's the more, uh, it's the more interesting part, and it's the more useful part, and it's the part that lasts longer, like it's the part that goes out into the world. So, for example, you can take your game design document, or like all of the lore that you have if you're making a nice big game, and you can put it all in there, and then you can start generating concepts and characters and world ideas and scenario ideas and dialogue ideas. And then pull the things that work and the things that you like somewhere and then edit them down into something that feels good and feels great and that you want, that's juicy, that you want to work with. So that's one example. Um, or you can write using the brain of another writer. So if it's not that you want to do your own thing, um, you can work with... We have a bunch of writers already in there and write with Leica, um, or you can just find anything on Project Gutenberg and like all the public domain stuff for, for writers who've been dead for 70 years. Um, you can find anything you want there and work with that. So like imagine making a little vignette game based on like Edgar Allan Poe stories or making some kind of uh, romance game that's really like highly influenced by Jane Austen. So myself and Mar have been actually, we started writing a book, <laughs> which is making it, where we made a brain that's a combination of H.P. Lovecraft, uh, Jane Austen, and cryptocurrency e-books. And it's a, it's a, it's a book, it's, it's a cosmic horror marriage plot about demons on the blockchain. And uh, it's <laughs> coming to you in 2025. Um, yeah, we're working on it. And it's absolutely fantastic fun. Um, mixing stuff together, like you don't have to have one brain at a time. Mix two brains together. Or maybe take your brain and your friend's brain and see what, what you're going to get out of that. Those kind of things are good. So that's, that's an interesting way you can work with it. Or it's also good for like training your writer's room to work with the same voice. So if you have like six people working on the same game, it takes ages for people to be able to write in the same voice. So if you've already got like a very large amount of work from like a previous game or from the dialogue that you're happy with, once the creative director has signed off on a particular amount of work, you can use that as like a brain to train. 
the rest of the writer's room to write in that style. Okay, next experiment is uh, creating depth in your characters quickly. So uh, M. Charity is a wonderful researcher from uh, New York University, and they make really cool things. Like you should check out their uh, paper, Baba is Yol, since you're all academic types here. Um, and M. Charity worked with us in the summer uh, as a kind of like machine learning, uh, uh, I wouldn't say intern, um, expert is the word, as a machine learning expert. And one of the cool things that they made while they were with us was a character creator. So M's character creator basically takes, uh, you, you write a little sentence, this is currently in Leica now, you write a little sentence about a character, and then uh, you can ask for the character, for some character traits to be expanded on. And it will trawl through tons and tons and tons of different types of uh, character traits from all over the place, TV tropes, Myers-Briggs, astrology databases, everywhere where character traits live. And then using like embeddings and things like that, it will bring them back together a bunch of things for you. So here's one example. Um, my friend Kat and I do this thing on Friday nights called Friday Night Leica, where we take a brain and we work with it for an hour and we make a story together using some, some writer. So last Friday we had Catherine Mansfield, the week before we did Alice in Wonderland. And a while ago we were making a story which had, which was starting to get into, it was a murder mystery, a locked room murder mystery, where it was like me and Kat and the other people who were in the chat also were all inside the room and we had to figure out which one of us was the murderer. And Kat was a, a baker, um, <laughs> and then we generated, so we wrote a little thing about Kat, and then generated the extra traits, and then you'll see the answer was right here. Anything is possible with a keen blade at the right moment. That's an interesting thing to have in there, in somebody's normal uh, <laughs> character description, um, when they are a, a suspect for a murder mystery. So yeah, that was a really exciting moment. And this is the kind of fun things that occur when using the character creator. So you can use this um, you, again, if you want, you can use the collaboratory notebook. We have it out there. It's not as updated as what we have in Leica, but you can use it, you can train it yourself, you can work on it out on the, on the side, or you can use the one that we have um, integrated in Leica at the moment too. Links are all on the resource page. And it's really good for, yeah, if you need to write multiple characters for an RPG. So, like I said at the start, I used to work at, uh, I used to work on RPGs. I used to be a real RPG writer. And sometimes you'd come in in the morning and you were going to have to write like seven conversations that day with different, I don't know, rats, dwarves, skeletons, <laughs> what have you. And uh, sometimes, you know, by about lunch, you'd be like, oh, what is this guy even about? Like, what is his deal? What's his, what's his vibe? And uh, when I would run out of like interesting little notes that I had in my notebook to make people about, you know, I'd be thinking, what is this guy about? Today, I would just go and go, what is this guy about? This is where he is, this is what's going on. And then I would get something like anything is possible with a keen blade at the right moment and I'd be away. It'd be amazing. Okay. Next. Oh, yeah. Experiment four is uh, sparking inspiration with Mid Journey. So this is... What this is good for, I think, is it's a really sweet way to concept with your team on the fly. And I think um, Kate's probably going to talk about this a little bit more later on. But I just wanted to show you how it's been working for me. Because so many creative techniques rely on accessing your subconscious. So I teach creative writing uh, a lot of the time. Experimental writing, creative writing, interactive fiction. And I use a lot of subconscious tools like getting people to draw three tarot cards and then write a story that connects those three things together. The power of that being that like nobody needs to know anything about tarot cards or believe tarot cards or care about tarot cards, but looking at these kind of symbolic images and then trying to connect them together activates the human pattern recognition machine. And this is like our brains are just dying <laughs> constantly looking around the world and trying to connect different and disparate things together. And so if you're giving like kind of randomness a chance to speak to you, your brain is going to be like, yes, and, yes, and. Like our brains are like an improv show all the time, trying to connect stuff together and make sense of the world and categorize things and put them into boxes so that we can feel safe. And I've been enjoying this, like outsourcing that part of like laying out the tarot cards a lot to the machines lately, because I'm starting to think that maybe mid-journey 
itself like has a collective, has a, has a line to our collective unconscious, which makes sense because it's like it's this pool of the, all these images that are put in there and all of this stuff being collected. And then we kind of leap in there and like pluck something out. So I've been working on it with Laika. And an, uh, this is a fantasy novel that I wrote many years ago. Many years ago, 10 years ago now, this year. Um, and I start out with like writing a little prompt from the book. So it's like, at the far end of town, past the ruined tower and the abandoned mine, lay the headquarters of the Amaranthine House. And I let uh, Mid Journey illustrate that for me. I'm starting to kind of make a little, sort of like little graphic novel vibe. And I look at that and it gives me some ideas, you know? It gives me ideas for what's next and thinking about where we're going to go. And like it gives me more ideas about what's next. The buildings are nothing more than dilapidated barracks for the most part, several stories high and cast in a dank pinkish hue from the coating of the river weed. So this is a brain trained on my fantasy novel, so it knows exactly what it doesn't know, but it can predict accurately what is going to come in these different moments. So the pinkish hue of the river weed is absolutely a concept that exists inside of my novel. And then we feed that in and, oh, look at this, isn't this nice? The pinkish hue of the river weed actually starts to coat the building and I start to kind of get the feeling of the space that we're in and what we're working with. And we can look, start to add in some characters and start thinking about what's happening next. Ladakh, this is a character, leaned in the doorway, smoking a pipe as he watched for the return of the centuries from the Choloman forest. And this is where I start to get very excited. So again, you might imagine me with the, the Cheeto dust on the fingers just at 2 a.m., just getting really hype about things. Because that's what... That's the power of creativity, right? Is that it can really get you excited and like may fill you up with, with ideas, with feelings, with emotions, with the sense that you're, you're onto something. You've got some sort of secret. You're understanding something that's happening and you're the one who's going to bring it out. You're the one who's going to bring it into fruition. So that's, what's, that's, what, that's just basically, I want everyone to have that feeling. That's what I'm trying to give people. So yeah, we get it in. We start getting more pictures. We've got the... The dock in the doorway, we've got the pinkish hue of the river weed, we've got the forest. I'm really feeling it. I've got the whole thing. And then we add in, we see what happens next. And uh, like it tells us, yeah, that a wild eyed girl, only half human, clad in a black cloak, is going to appear. And there she is. And that's, yeah, that's exciting for me. So I think if you're looking to like, or you want to show any kind of quick illustrations to your team of the kind of stuff you want to look at, the kind of thing you're thinking about, Mid Journey is fantastic for that. And uh, if you want to use it, if you don't already have an account, we have a Midjourney server in our Leica Discord that you can use because if you go to the main Midjourney Discord, it's actually pretty stressful because it's got so many thousands of images are just constantly flipping by, flipping by, flipping by. Nobody uses our one. I don't know why, but nobody uses it except me. So it's a very nice space to come and hang out and make your images. Okay. Last experiment, working together to write something unique. And now we'll see if I can do this without making a mess. All right, so uh, I thought what we could try and do, usually um, when I do this kind of live demo, it's with people who are usually like write writers. Um, and so we usually try to do something that's around rules of writing, or we start a short story that begins with like the situation we're in and we find out what happens and we call in the brains of different writers to figure out what's going on. I thought what could be an interesting thing for us today, but I'm very open to, the, to any suggestions, is that we could ask for some constraints for our game jam, because what is a game jam without weird and interesting constraints? And I thought we could ask maybe five different uh, characters <laughs> from the past about what kind of constraints they might have for us. What do you think about that? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to start with Marcus, because I love Marcus Aurelius. Um, and he will give us something that's very heartfelt, I believe. And then we can, and then you guys can choose a brain for the next one. So, how should we ask for this constraint? Hmm. Does anyone have any ideas? Does anyone have it? Should it be around writing or images or? Very quiet people today. It's very Monday morning vibe here. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start then. Um, so, when making a game, the most important thing is, so we're just going to ask him what it can be, and we have three options, so we can always choose, the, it is always will give us three different versions of the inference, and we can choose which one we want to go for. 
So the most important thing is to make it as good as it can be, and not just any old game, any old, old game, a good one, one that people enjoy, one that will stand the test of time, one that will stand up to criticism. That's very bland, I would say. Let's see what else he's got. Make it fun. Simple, 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 simple. Okay, got a little bit broken there. Or avoid trivialities. Okay, I'm, I think avoid trivialities is the best one here. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, who should be our next person? These are our options. Um, we have, these are my favorites, we can look at all. So there's like the public brains, then there's my brains, and then there's locked brains. So, Lewis, okay. So, what should uh, what, what do you think Lewis is going to have something to say about? It must have a story. Indeed. Indeed. I don't agree. Slay the Spire is my favorite game. Some sort of meaning. Okay. I have a good hook. Okay. What do we think? This one? Okay. Well, then we'll take away all this irrelevant stuff that's bringing us back into the story world and keep the good hook. Okay, who's next? Yeah. Do you have George Orwell there? Uh, no, I don't. And it will take us five minutes to train the brain, sadly. But we could do that later. Um, I believe we do. He's in the... He's in one of the shared brains. Oh, sorry, but the title of my talk. No, I don't think he's here right now. We have H.G. Wells, Kafka, <laughs> Robespierre. I don't know, maybe Robespierre is good. <laughs> so... Robespierre, when people criticize my game, I need to be able to offer something better than they do. <laughs> yep. Or they should give me a chance to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> or I have a moral obligation to respond by improving it. Wow, these are very different. This is a very branching narrative. So what do we think? Hands up for offer something better. Hands up for give a chance to fix. Hands up for moral obligation. I think the moral obligations have it, guys. <laughs> okay, if it's not perfect, then I have a moral duty to improve it. So I could go on literally forever, and I do all the time. But since today uh, I am here for a small amount of time, there's only three minutes left. So I think I should take questions, right, Anna Kaiser? Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chara. That's wonderful. Uh, I hope you don't feel morally obliged to, <laughs> to fix the jam games because it's, it's, it's fantastic if they have mistakes. I think we already have a question from our professor, Perto Hamelain, in there on the background. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the wonderful talk. Really inspiring. Um, I know this is a kind of hard question, and um, it's okay if you don't have the perfect answer. I, I certainly don't, but I've been... So my, my journey here is, uh, I was like really enthusiastic about AI generation. I've been teaching this uh, kind of AI in art, media art and design course here for five years now mm -hmm. uh, in different iterations. But now only recently then I have kind of studied, really worry about the ethical side of things. And I'm now siding with the kind of pro artist camp pretty firmly. And uh, looking forward to see, for instance, the class action litigation against the image generations, how that will work, and mm -hmm. the co-pilot one. Uh, so I really appreciate your uh, strategy that you can really only train on dead authors and public domain content. But what are your kind of 
forge on, you're still building on a foundation model that has been trained on scrape material that you don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, you're using mid-journey, uh, you're fine-tuning your uh, whatever GPD model. So what, what should, so what, what should be done? Is that like viable in the future? Is there any other way? And then for instance, uh, this writer's room example. So you train on people who give consent to use their material, but what happens when somebody resigns from that mm. team and then their intellectual input is still in the model? Does, does the model have to be scrapped or? Well, I mean, on that one, I, on that last one, I, I definitely think that that's part of being uh, in paid employment. I mean, I stopped working for Larian, but people are still playing all my games and reading my words every day, and I don't get any royalties from that. So I got paid for that work while I was there doing that work. So I think, for me, that part is OK. Um, just want to clarify as well, we don't use mid-journey in our product. That's a, we just happen to have it in our server because it's fun to have a little server there. Um, I am very, very, very on the side of uh, we as writers, we as artists, we as creators need to harness the new technology that is coming to make things that work for us. Because if we don't, somebody else will. And I, I kind of always come back to this feeling of like when, like when I see people kind of like this idea of like the the horseshoe makers, like when the horseshoe, when the car started to come in and the horseshoe makers were like, well, you can't do this because what are we going to do? We're horseshoe makers. It's like, well, people are not going to stop using AI because the horseshoe makers, i.e. me, um, tell them that it doesn't feel good because it does feel good to them. So how can we make it so that we as writers are like consulted, compensated, and like actually part, like a real part of the process. So we've had a lot of, like myself and, and Martin, we do a lot of talks with VCs at the moment because we're trying to get some funding so that we can build this into something real because we want to make it into a platform that works with writers, that works with publishers. And I get a, quite a few questions where they're like, okay, so cool, so okay, right, like we're just going to take this corpus of this writer and then we just put it in and then we press a button and it's going to write a new book for that writer, right? Cool, and then we sell that for millions. Great, can't wait. And we're like, well, actually, no. <laughs> not only do we not want to make that, but you can't make that because the human always has to be in the loop to make something useful, to make something beautiful, to make something that resonates with the humans. Like, that's why like, I have had a, a person over the weekend, I was talking to one of our users who was like, not happy with the way that Leica was working for them. And it turned out they weren't happy because they didn't like having to choose between options. They didn't want to choose, they wanted it to just work. And it's never gonna just work. Our product will never work. <laughs> you have to work it uh, to make it work. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question very well, but my feeling is like, Unlike the NFTs, where the games industry just said, no way, get lost, we don't want you, and then the poor NFT people just lay down and died, that's not going to happen with AI. <laughs> um, it's just not, because it's way too much of a wave, and it's already like with ChatGPT coming out, and with people starting to get used to working with it, it's just, it's going to happen. So how can we make it happen in the way that works for writers, rather than in a way that only works for the people who want to Cut, cut writers. I don't know. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, at, at least yeah, the gist of it. I really get that, and we can continue the discussion later. Okay, uh, cool. Th thanks a lot. Are you going to the dinner later? Uh, yes, I will. Okay, there. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Let's chat. I think this topic is right, really right now, and there is a lot of things and, and uh, things to discuss and figure it out. But yeah. you also mentioned that you're maybe planning on how the writers could kind of monetize their brains, was it called brains, in, yeah. in the system. So maybe open up a little bit of potential future with that. Yeah, so I mean, our, our hope is to make a platform. So at the moment, you've seen how inside like the, the brain menu, you can see all the different brains. And at the moment, like writers can come in, and if they want, they can just share their brain with anyone and have it work. But we want to make it so that they can actually share that for a small fee, have it kind of like a Spotify for writers. So that like, for example, like maybe Stephen King would want to come and work with us. Maybe the Tolkien estate would join the 21st century. You know, maybe Robert Ludlum, that guy's been dead for years and he still takes out a book every Christmas. So like <laughs> there's perhaps a bunch of IP holders and writers and estates who could 
be interested in like actually making content so that people can write really good fan fiction of the writers that they yeah. work with. There's also another question I was thinking that for the when I arrived to games research back in the 2005 or so, there was a kind of a, almost uh, like two camps. The one camp was thinking that you know writing and games doesn't really mix that well, but then re we realized that maybe just the writing wasn't that great. So <laughs> it's been a huge journey from that day to today, mm -hmm. and uh, you expressed that you kind of you are looking for in these tools to improve your processes. So what could be the, what are the things that you're most excited? What are the things that now you can potentially use your writer's brain into doing what instead of some of the tedious things perhaps? Yeah, so th that's a really nice question. Thanks, Anna Kaisa. Um, so I guess what I'm, I'm almost more compelled by what I'm not excited by than what I am excited by, because what I'm never excited by is productivity or optimization or like making things work better, because that's not fun or interesting to me, and it's not where you find the really cool and interesting things. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm very proud that when we ask people, does Leica save you time, everyone says no. It's <laughs> like, great. That's not what we want it to do. It doesn't want to be save time. Yeah. What's exciting to me is that it finds the weird stuff. Mm. Key, anything is possible with the keen blade at the right moment. While you're working in this like blank page mindset, sometimes, like when you're just writing, not editing, when you're writing, you can get stuck and then you can walk yourself into corners. Or if you're a writer like me, you can start to think, I can only write it down when it's the right thing. It has to be the correct thing. So I can't just write anything down. And so loosening yourself up to possibilities, to potentials, and to things that might happen, for me, is where it's exciting. Hmm. I don't know. I, I just want to I just want to I just want to make weird stuff <laughs> forever. Yeah, so I think that yeah. uh, it's it's kind of our brains are uh, yeah. built so that we are more prone to be conventional and we are efficient being or afraid. the same. Yeah. And we are socially also afraid. Yeah. So maybe there is a chance to get us to get even more weird, maybe what Thorsten would like us to be with games, to be more something that we haven't done before. One more question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you again for the talk. It was excellent, very inspiring. Uh, I'm kind of curious, you're open to using uh, dead authors and public domain stuff and maybe stuff consensually, but how do you feel about using uh, Creative Commons licensed stuff for AI writing? Do you think it's a gray line? Or does it have like a boundary that you're, you think shouldn't be crossed? How do you feel about that? Um, I think I mean, it depends on the license. I mean, there's, there's different types of Creative Commons license mm -hmm. as well. But like whichever, whatever license it is, so long as they give you permission to use it, then you can use it. But like our, our job, like with like, we are extremely uninterested in being part of any kind of testing court case about <laughs> how AI can or should be used. So we are very, 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 um, what's the word, uh, cautious. If anyone reports, like we have a reporting function so people can report brains for you know, inappropriate content or copyright or anything like that, if anything even has a hint of not being okay, we're gonna take it down um, at this point in time. So like, yeah, we say you, you, are, it's, you are responsible for ensuring that you have the rights to the material that you're using and then you own what you get out of it the other side. And if you do anything weird, we're gonna take it down. Of course. I'm sure it's going to get more sophisticated as we go along, but early days. Yeah. Thank you, Shar, for mm -hmm. such a wonderful example of uh, how to write with uh, AI tools. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to see where the company goes and hopefully not to any of the court cases. <laughs> hopefully not. So we're moving into the break <laughs> and we'll be back in about an hour. Thank you. Mm -hmm.